Good morning. Thanks everybody for coming on day three of the summit. Um, the past two days, we've been talked a lot about the route to market, the permitting issue, um, and the supply chain issue. And today, day three is all about job, workforce, skill sets, and just transition. And this session, we are going to focus on just transition, which is a big topic. Because as we know, Australia has a very big coal industry. And for the offshore sector, and what we want to do is to provide that just transition so that we provide fair and uh, equitable job placement for the workforce. And how do we do that? And we're very lucky today to have Mark, Mark Wickenham, with us, who has spent lots of time looking into the just transition journey in Europe and how that could be copied or transferred into the Australian case. And Mark will share us um, some learnings from the, that study, and then we will have a fair chat with fire set chat with Mark on this topic. And Mark was awarded a church, uh, Churchill Fellowship in 2020 to study successful energy transition that supports the aspiration of workers and communities in Europe. In particular, he studied just transition programs and authorities and the development of the offshore wind industry. Mark works for the Sunrise Project as Australian Program Director and is a board member of the Sustainability Victoria. He has over two decades experience working on climate and sustainability policies, campaigns, and communications. He had held leadership roles in the Australian environment and union movement, including as CEO of Environment Victoria, and as senior advisor for the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Mark holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and Commerce Economics and graduate uh, diploma in adult education. And he's the graduate of Australian Institute of Company Directors. <laughs> Sorry about the last line. <laughs> yeah. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's a very large room, isn't it? Nice to see you all. Thank you for being here this morning. I understand it was a fairly late night last night. Um, so you've all gone pretty deep on offshore wind and hydrogen and the opportunities um, for Australia and the region this week. You've talked about supply chains, you've talked about policy, you've talked about procurement, workforce, permitting, etc. Um, so I wanted to use this time and, you know, first session uh, on the last day of the conference to zoom out and, and tell a few stories. Some stories about where we've come from, particularly in Australia, uh, where we're at at the moment, where we need to get to, and how we might get there. And I'll share a couple of lessons from overseas about how other places are managing their energy transition to ensure that it's both fast and fair. But first, a little history for those of you um, lucky enough not to have lived through the last couple of decades of Australian climate policy. Here's where we've come from, right back um, from when Australia was one of the very few countries around the world that was um, refusing to sign the Kyoto Protocol right up until 2007 when we had a change of government. And we've really been a drag on global ambition on climate change for so much of the last 20 years. That has, there's been exceptions to that. There's been really strong state government leadership, um, but overall our record as a nation is really patchy. And at times our climate policy has been dictated by our trade policy and our economic policy. And you know, our largest exports are, are iron ore, coal, metallurgical, coal, thermal, and gas in um, roughly that order. So it's really dominated our, our climate and trade policy, but Australia has been through a profound uh, series of climate impacts um, through some of the worst bushfires on record in the lead up to the federal election last year, large parts of the eastern coast were 
underwater. And then last year, sorry, uh, is it, uh, yeah, last year, um, we had a change of government and on election night, we had the Prime Minister promising to end the climate wars and saying together we can take advantage of the opportunity for Australia to be a renewable energy superpower. So that's, been, that's a very large shift. It's taken a very long time to make that shift. Um, it's a fragile shift because it's not bipartisan, but um, we had an election that was largely determined on the issue of climate change. It was one of the, you know, one of, if not the key issues in the election campaign. Uh, and we f are finally seeing a level of political will at both the federal and state level. So we've come a long way. But in the meantime, of course, um, Australia and the world has continued to put more um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than at any other time in human history. And this chart shows um, global sea temperatures, which every day for the past six months have um, reached new record highs in, uh, you know, in, re in recorded uh, history. And they've gone, they, you know, you hear, um, you hear often hear economists saying things have gone off the charts. Well, what's happening in our global sea temperatures is actually off the charts. It was not predicted to happen in any of the climate models that we have been using for the past couple of decades. It wasn't predicted to happen for decades, you know, the second half of this century and it's happening now. So in some ways we've come a long way, in other ways we're in a really difficult and uh, dangerous place. So that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> um, that's, that's the very quick, you know, where we've come from. I'm now gonna, and, and you know, there's a lot of contradictions in that because, you know, we all know that we're installing more renewable energy than at any time ever before. Um, some of you would have seen um, the, the, the stat this week that we're installing a gigawatt of solar a day on the planet. Um, and we've got really exciting industries like offshore wind and green hydrogen, which are growing extremely quickly. Um, but still, we're so far from where we need to be. And it's that, I guess, that chasm between uh, our ambition and where we need, where the climate science says we need to get to and where we actually are is, is a very large gap. And the question is, how do we close that gap? And how do we do that in a way that builds the most possible community license, social license, engagement from workforces and regions around the planet. So where we're at, um, so this is just to highlight again that we still have an awful lot of work to do. So Australia is one of the largest polluters uh, on the planet. We're, I think we're the 15th largest nation and we are among the highest per capita polluters. Um, so we're responsible for 1.6% of global emissions this is just from our domestic economy with 0.3% of the global population. But actually our domestic emissions is only one part of the story. Um, our domestic emissions are around 500 million tons a year, but our exports are around 1.2 billion tons of CO2 per year. Um, and most of that is going to Asia, the region which has the fastest growing energy demand of any region on the planet. And for the last decade or two, our trade policy, our economic policy, our climate policy has really been trying to maintain the dominance of our export coal industry, increasingly of our export gas industry, uh, and delaying the world's shift and, and that region's shift to cleaner energy fuel sources. It's the same story for gas. Um, we're the world's equal largest LNG exporter, and most of that LNG is going to Asia. So we're providing the, the fastest growing region uh, in the world in terms of energy demand with polluting energy when what they're all saying, you know, those countries, they all have net zero emissions targets. They're saying we have a plan to get to zero emissions. So um, it's very, I've, I've jumped ahead of myself, but this is just showing you that um, 
the energy demand growth in Asia is higher than any other region in the world. But the opportunity for us is instead of exporting these highly polluting project products that these countries have already indicated that um, they want to phase out because they have net zero emissions targets, the opportunity is for us to replace that export revenue and those jobs with genuinely clean exports. And as a, you know, you know, there's a bunch of studies that have shown how we can do this, but um, some of the primary ways are by exporting green iron, developing a green steel industry, green metals like green aluminium, renewable hydrogen, ammonia, and you know, there's been studies by Business Council of Australia, Australian Council of Trade Unions, um, environment groups like Beyond Zero Emissions, Australian Conservation Foundation, um, recently by uh, the, I think it was Westpac Bank, um, which basically said the opportunity in, in green metals and um, clean, clean energy exports and critical minerals is actually larger than the current revenue that we're getting from um, products that are making the climate problem worse. So there's a really large opportunity there. So it's possible um, for us to shift from where we're at as a major exporter of polluting products to a renewable energy powerhouse, but how do we get there? We have around 50,000 50, Australians working in the coal and gas industries, around 40,000 in coal and around 10,000 in oil and gas. Um, and other countries have been grappling with this problem of what do you do when you decide that an industry needs to be phased out, um, either for economic reasons or for climate reasons. Um, how do you manage that transition? And I just want to share one case study with you of how that's being done in Spain. Um, so the country's a little further ahead than Australia with its energy transition. They're at 47% renewable energy. They've legislated three planks of climate policy with equal standing. So they have a national emissions reductions target. They have a national climate and energy plan, which includes their renewable energy and energy efficiency targets. And they have a just transition strategy. And they all have equal standing. And initially, um, transition were policies, policies were driven by the fact that coal mining was actually uneconomic in, in most parts of Spain. Um, then in two, but in two days, so, so the industry had contracted a lot already, but then they decided that what they needed to do really, because these communities were suffering, was take a much more active um, approach in planning the phase out of those industries. So they used a social dialogue model to bring together industry leaders, peak business bodies, trade unions, community leaders, and government to develop a, a just energy transition plan um, for thermal power plant closures. And that report on the left, I, I, for, those, for the Australians in the room, you know, we hear a lot about the need for a just transition plan. They actually have a national just transition plan. You can go to their website, you can download it, and it outlines how they're gonna manage this transition. The strategy is updated every five years. It identifies the, the 14 most vulnerable regions in the country. Um, for each of those regions, uh, a regional just transition agreement is developed with the local community and resource, so the local community and workers get to have a say in what are the priorities for economic development in their region. And then there's a just transition institute that is resourced by government um, to oversee implementation of, of the just transition plans. And importantly, there's money on the table. So um, the Spanish government has earmarked 250 billion sorry, million euro um, for just transition plans, but they can access the 19 billion euro just transition fund. So when COVID hit Europe and the world, um, you know, Australia, our national government response, apart from the health response, the economic recovery response was our gas-led recovery. Europe instead developed essentially a Green New Deal, which accelerated the energy transition, and they, they directed public investment in a way that would address, address both the health crisis and the economic crisis, but also the climate crisis. So just to give you a little bit more, so these are the regions, the colored spots on the map, a little bit difficult to say, to see, but that graph down the bottom, table down the bottom, basically just shows you the status of every single just transition agreement. And these are you know, updated monthly. Um, you can go to the website and find out where it's at, how many people have participated, how many projects have been funded, et cetera. 
And you know, the, the recipe of things that these communities are asking for and that are in these plans is probably not unfamiliar. But for instance, um, workers are eligible for a pension at 50 years of age, that's retiring coal power station workers or coal miners, there's retraining and re redeployment programs. Um, carers are eligible for welfare payments. This is an important thing where you know, the primary income earner in a household loses their job. Um, quite often there's been unpaid care work happening in those households and that hadn't been eligible for welfare payments in Spain. And through these just transition agreements, that has actually become um, a, a legitimate reason to receive welfare payments when it, where a family's lost a, a worker in the fossil fuel industry. Job banks to find affected workers uh, work in site remediation and rehabilitation and also in renewable energy, particularly nearly all the sites where closing power stations are happening are being redeployed for other renewable energy purposes. And as one um, energy executive said to me from NL Green Power, he basically said, you never leave an energy generation site in Europe. It's really hard to get access to an energy generation site. You know, we've heard about all the permitting issues. So therefore, um, once you've got access to it, you want to re repurpose it, turn it into, um, you know, a, a site for green hydrogen production or batteries or solar farm, et cetera. Government investment in local infrastructure and attracting private investment. And there has been specific government tenders to connect renewable energy generation to existing grid infrastructure in regions disproportionately affected by coal closure. So we can do all of this. And you know, Australia has recently committed to a net zero transition authority, uh, which is currently being established by the federal government. And we can actively plan the phase down of coal and gas, mining and extraction and combustion, and look at ways to redeploy workers in the clean energy goods and services that the world really needs. Um, but there's a lot of work in doing all of that. That's, Spain's been on that journey for four or five years already. The second case study um, is um, what you've been talking about all week. And in, in some, you know, a lot of you will know about parts or all of this um, much more deeply than I will. But I spent a week um, in Denmark with all, um, looking at, meeting with people from all stages of the offshore wind industry, from you know, energy utilities, government policy makers, um, port operators, uh, turbine manufacturers, shipbuilders, um, servicing vessel suppliers, and um, learnt an incredible amount. The, the trip was sort of curated by this fellow on the left who's the head of the Danish Seafarers Union uh, and, and Metal Workers Union. And the unions in Denmark see a huge opportunity in offshore wind and renewable energy more generally. So when the, the common theme that I took from all of these conversations that I was having was that an offshore wind project is sort of more appropriately thought about as, a, as an infrastructure project and as an infrastructure project with kind of global dimensions to get all these pieces right. So obviously, we, you know, we've talked this week, it starts with ports and, you know, the ports, um, it can take five to seven years to get approvals in place, do environmental assessments, ensure that the infrastructure is upgraded and able to withstand you know, the incredibly heavy equipment and foundations um, of the turbines. Uh, so, so their experience has been that some of the ports have taken a decade to actually prepare for an offshore wind industry. And in some cases it's been an iterative process. They've been able to, you know, make the road while walking. Um, but from an Australian perspective, like we've been having some troubles with infrastructure projects of late, you might have noticed. They're, they're costing a lot more than they should have and the time for the projects to be built is blowing out. And so if we want a part of this industry, we really need to get organised and make sure we've got all the approvals uh, in place for port upgrades. And I know the Victorian government's moving pretty quickly on that now. And just to, uh, as a photo I, I took um, at the port of Ruin on the east coast, uh, oh, it's on, on an island actually, off the coast uh, of Denmark, um, just to sh show the size of those nacelles. For anyone who hasn't seen in person these, I think these were 12 uh, megawatt 
turbine nacelles. I mean, those nacelles, you could have a dance party with about 150 people in one of those nacelles. They are just incredibly uh, large and incredibly heavy. And so that, you know, a lot of foundation underpinning work needs to happen at the ports. And as you've talked a lot about this week, once you've got the port, you need the construction vessels and the jack-up vessels. And, you know, the exciting thing is that this global offshore wind industry is growing at around 30 to 40% a year. But what that means is that every single existing uh, construction vessel in the offshore wind industry is fully contracted for years. And um, it's mainly fully contracted to regions that have mature uh, offshore wind markets and a pipeline of projects. So, you know, for new geographies, you essentially need to commission the construction of new offshore wind construction vessels. And there's only three shipyards globally that are equipped to build these offshore wind construction vessels. And at the moment, it's more profitable for them to be building LNG tankers than offshore wind construction vessels. So that's a, that's a big challenge. So you've got this long lead time for ports, you've got this long lead time uh, to make sure you've got construction vessels, and then once you've built the offshore wind construction, sorry, the offshore wind farm, which might take 12 months to 18 months, uh, and you've connected to the transmission infrastructure, which will take more time again, and you go into the operations phase for the next 15 or 20 years, for each gigawatt wind farm, you need a vessel like this um, to transport and house workers who service the wind farms uh, around the clock and around the year. And there's a lot of jobs in that. Each of these vessels might, you know, take 120, 140 seafarers out to sea for a month at a time to do this um, maintenance work. Um, but there's also a shortage of these kind of ships. And these ships, you know, companies like Catalar, who may well be here at the conference, who are building these ships, takes two or three years from the time that you order one of these ships before you actually receive it. So there's a huge amount of logistics to get a wind project underway, you know, from upgrading ports, getting uh, licensing and environmental approvals, getting regulations in place in a place like Australia where we haven't actually got all of those regulations in place yet, securing a construction vessel, building the wind farm, rehabilitating any damage to the seafloor that's done during construction, um, and finding skilled crew to operate the ships. And there's, as you are probably aware, particularly since COVID, there is a global shortage of seafarers. So I'm not telling you this story to make it all sound impossible. Like, I think it's absolutely possible but you need to be really organized and really proactive, and you need a government with its hands actively on the steering wheels of industry policy, and actually planning a pipeline of projects so that it is worth um, global wind companies sending a ship to the Southern Hemisphere, because it's a long way from the Northern Hemisphere, sending a ship to the Southern Hemisphere for a couple of years, then it's, or, or longer, you know, committing vessels to this geography and the Asian region for the next few decades to be building wind farms and training the crew and training the wind crane operators, who, by the way, are the highest, so, the, so the, the workers who are connecting the blades with the nacelles in the offshore wind farms when they're building them are the highest paid workers in the North Sea. They're getting paid more than anyone in the oil and gas industry because they're the, the most skilled workers. So I'm nearly done. Um, I'm just going to finish by taking you to actually this same port. Um, this is Esberg, and apologies to any Danish people. Uh, I've probably mangled the pronunciation of that. Um, uh, it's a port on the west coast of Denmark, um, which formerly was a fishing town, and it had a fish factory, and it was a bit of a... Um, you know, people I spoke to there said it used to be kind of the laughing stock of um, Denmark. It was, it was a working class area, it was looked down upon a bit, and it was known for the smell of the fish factory, the canning factory. Um, and it had, you know, at, at one point it had about 700 um, fishing vessels. Um, and then the fishery collapsed in the 70s. And uh, they, they um, instead repurposed the vessels for offshore uh, offshore oil and gas um, servicing and construction, et cetera. And they've recently had a new 
Renaissance, that's an offshore wind town. And I'll just, this is a 90 second video, I'll just show you, it's very jerky, I took it on a boat, I should have had someone who knew what they were doing in terms of making the video, but I think it gives you a sense of um, the story fairly quickly. G'day, I'm coming to you from the west coast of Denmark this morning um, in Esberg, uh, and I've been very kindly shown around the port here by a company called Esvark, who um, are involved in um, wind turbine servicing offshore and also the oil and gas industry. Um, this port used to be a fishing town um, and then it became an oil and gas town and it's increasingly becoming an offshore wind servicing centre. Um, and so now this, this company that we're visiting this morning, Esfark, they have, I think it's 10 um, ships that are involved in servicing offshore wind farms um, a little over 20 in the oil and gas sector, but actually most of the earnings now coming um, from the offshore wind sector. And this ship here is one of the ships that goes out. Basically the large, um, the large wind turbine operators and wind farms like Vestas and Ørsted um, contract one of these ships for 10 or 15 years for each large wind farm. And then they go out and um, spend a month at each of the wind farms, the crew spend a month there servicing the wind farms year round. Less less crew in winter, but there can be up to 100 people on these ships. Um, and it's you know there's a, this company now employs uh, about 100 people in the office and about a thousand people at sea. Um, so it's become a very important industry for this region, and that's just operations and maintenance jobs. That, this isn't the the construction part of the industry. I'll show you a little bit more later. So that was just one company. There's several companies that have a fleet of ships in that town. I, the sound was a bit awful, but so that company, Spark, is employing 1,100 people in a small regional town, uh, smaller than um, Traugan and Morwell in Latrobe Valley, for those of you from Victoria. Um, and so offshore wind industry playing a very big part in that. Uh, community's economy. And I did just, uh, at the same time, you know, when the, they, they, they were servicing these vessels in 12, 14 metre waves, sorry, servicing the um, offshore wind farms in 12, 14 metre, metre waves in the North Sea, just uh, incredibly skilled and difficult work. But when the conditions were just too rough, they were manufacturing boats, um, uh, rescue vessels um, in the factories there, which just really showed that they had been thinking very carefully about how do you create a sustainable year-round economy and with good quality jobs. And my final slide um, comes from Berlin. This is a photo of the Berlin Wall, very famous photograph of two socialist leaders, um, Erich Honecker and Leonard Brezhnev from the Soviet era. And it was, it was it's a photo um, which is, um, of what was called the socialist fraternalist, fraternal kiss, to demonstrate it to show the very close links between communist countries. And the reason I show this is because um, when I was in Berlin and hearing the story about the Berlin Wall and you know the division between East and West Germany, you know, the Berlin Wall seemed permanent up until the very moment that it wasn't. And the East German secret police, the Stasi, grew in number right up until the day, and actually there'd never been more secret police in <laughs> East Germany um, than the day when the wall came down. So um, things, the, the, the experience of being in Europe in a time of war, so this was uh, last year, um, heading into winter uh, and Europe's energy crisis over winter, which turned out not to be anywhere near as bad as people were expecting. But it really felt like a lot was happening in a very short period of time. And it reminded me of that um, quote by Lenin, which is that there are decades when nothing happens and then weeks when decades happen. And so extraordinary change can happen very quickly. And even in the six weeks while I was out of the country, the Victorian government um, revived the State Electricity Commission and announced their offshore wind targets. AGL introduced, which is Australia's largest energy generator and retailer, 
um, announced a plan to bring forward the retirement date of their coal fleet and to um, lean much he more heavily into renewables. And the Queensland government announced their plan to accelerate closure of all of their coal-fired power stations. So it can all happen very quickly. And for it to happen quickly and well, we, we need some really firm guidance, leadership, industry policy, and as I said before, government with its hands on the steering wheel of the energy transition to make sure it's working for workers and communities. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Really, really interesting sharing on all this, all this insights into the just transition journey in Europe. Um, I also have a quick slide to share before we sit down. Yeah, this is a slide that a few months ago that my colleague and I put together that we were trying to look into this topic, just transition, the workforce, the skill set that is very much needed for us to move forward. So first, I want to share with you this statistics, which was published by the IEA from the World Energy Outlook um, in 2021, which says clean energy industry provides job growth more than offsets a decline in the traditional fossil fuel supply sector in all IEA scenarios. This is actually quite remarkable because when we talk about the transition, the energy transition, workforce, the loss of the jobs is one of the top thing that came, came in. But did we also know this, that the clean energy sector is offering more than enough to take in all the, the jobs that are being offset by the, by the decline of the fossil industry? Then if this message is clear, then the challenge lies to us is to match that and really provide that transition into the clean energy technology. This one shows the job or the workforce data in the renewable energy markets. By 2021, we have 12.7 million worldwide employment in the renewable energy sector. If you go to the point three on the right-hand side, it actually shows that IRENA estimated that by, estimated that by 2030, the energy sector could, could give rise to 139 million of jobs, which is almost like tenfold growth as of the number of 2021. So that's the growth. And then if we take a further look at all this, all this employment, about two thirds of that are happening in Asia. And the most important two sectors of the renewables, that solar and wind industry, accounts for about 40% of the workforce. So that's, those are the basic stats that we want to share with you on the renewable energy jobs. And then if we look into the wind sector, 1.37 million jobs are within the wind um, sector. And the top 10 countries, it's very concentrated. The top 10 countries accounts for about like 1.3 million jobs, which is also true because the top 10 um, countries also kind of like accumulated more than 90% of the wind installation. And then if we look at the FTEs that is generated by per megawatt installation for onshore, for a typical 50 megawatt of onshore product um, with a 25 year of lifespan, then each megawatt is able to generate 5.24 FTEs per year, FTE years, um, FTE year. And then if we look into the offshore sector, for a typical 500 megawatt on a 25 life span, it's 17.29 FTE year per megawatt. Next one. If we further into, look into these data, data, we can find that the top five companies is very much control half of the market for the manufacturer um, workforce. And 80% of those employed in the wind sector are working in the manufacturing and in the installation of the new turbines. But that is also to say that 20% of that is in the O&M sector. And if we look at the opportunities, we can also see that um, for oil and gas workers, the skill force the, or the skill sets is very valuable for, for them to be trans, transferred or transitioned into the offshore sector. And the ports and ship infrastructure development will also drive more employment. 
and also new opportunities also lies in the recycling of different components, which is like a new sector that start to pick up. And then if we look into just transition, this is still very much a concept that a lot of the countries are still trying to navigate how to really do it. And Mark just showed the case of Spain. They did it. They did it with the just transition plan. But when we look at it, what are the key elements? This is an IRENA definition of a holistic approach to make the just, trans uh, just transition a reality. And number one, it means it needs to address the structural barriers, um, which, which are the things that we've been talking uh, in the past two days. We should re reduce the fossil fuel dependency. We should increase the supply chain strength and uh, resilience of that. And we should ad address different like trade, trade issues when it comes to this. And second, we should overcome the, the potential job misalignment as tr energy transition unfold. That's, that's a very big topic. <laughs> How do we really do the misalignment? Um, that, that is probably the, the kind of like the challenge lies in with every one of us that we need to find this. We need to find a pathway to really match the jobs um, and, and make it really, make that transition really happen. And the third one is to support the diversity um, in ways to offer like equal opportunities to men and women, use minority and marginalized groups. Um, so these are the three key elements outlined by IRENA, um, but, but these are still like the, the guidance that we need to implement that. We still have a long way to go to really define every element under this. And then when it comes to like defining a good job, what, what comes into the mind? First, well, the, this, this graph on the right-hand side give us some, 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 some different criteria for us to look at that. First and foremost is the safety standards. And when it comes to the offshore industry, when it comes to go out into the sea, this is one of the first and foremost thing for us to consider. And second, the retirement, the other benefits. Third, the medical insurance, the wage, the job security, and the labor rights. It all come into one package that defines like the good job. And I also have a case study, which I'll, I'll go very, very quick. This is something that we did about two years ago, which is to help the Singapore government and the, also the Singapore offshore marine um, um, industry to look into their transition into offshore wind. And we did a full report on mapping how this transition can happen, what are the different challenges, uh, what has been made possible, and it's very promising. We found um, that there are already cases that successful trans transition is happening, uh, that, that industry are, are transitioning, are finding opportunities from the offshore oil and gas industry into the offshore wind industry. There are gaps for like trainings that we identified. There are gaps that for like, um, like shown on the, on the second page, that for persuading or giving the higher management more educational awareness on this transition is real, it's really happening, and we need more resources, but it's happening. I think the key message is that it is happening and there are ways of accelerating it. And that this is actually the kind of the, the positive note that we want to conclude for my slides here, that yes, just transition is a concept. We need to navigate all these different challenges, but it is also happening and that we have real life cases in Europe. And as this case shows in Singapore, in the offshore wind, in the offshore oil and gas industry transitioning automatically into the offshore wind industry. Um, so with that, I will we'll come back to Mark. Hello. Yeah, thanks Mark for all the really interesting sharings today. Um, yesterday, we were very lucky to have Minister Bowen here, and he was really a visionary guy, and 
talked to us a lot about Australia's ambitions for developing offshore wind and also the green hydrogen. And he also made a very interesting remark saying that Australia is a latecomer, which is true. Like the, your first two slides show that I still remember that they were one of the stubborn <laughs> countries on refusing to sign Kyoto and doing all the naughty things yes. on, on the climate change issue. And, and he said, okay, Australia is a latecomer, but they are studying hard overnight to catch up. So what's your feeling about this and how optimistic you are for Australia to provide the energy transition and also further to provide the just transition? Yeah. Thanks, Siming. Um, look, I'm really encouraged by uh, the ambition uh, of the current government and its early efforts to um, revive uh, investment in um, some of our clean energy industries and also map out a path for new uh, industries like offshore wind. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the just transition part of that. Um, like I'm really optimistic that in places like Victoria, um, where we can have a large offshore wind industry you know, in the same region where there's offshore oil and gas workers and pretty close to Gippsland where there's a lot of workers in the coal industry, I'm pretty optimistic that we can redeploy workers or support those that are near retirement and diversify that regional economy uh, and have a very powerful and valuable industry. I think it's going to be harder in places like Queensland uh, or Western Australia. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, there's been a bit of language about Australia being out of the naughty corner when it comes to, you know, global climate negotiations. But we are, it's true, we're, we're starting to act to reduce our domestic emissions, although even this week we saw emissions reports came out that showed that our emissions are still flat. They're not actually going down as a nation yet. Um, but until we actually, like the, the just transition piece requires us to actually address our exports as well. And that's where most of the jobs are, you know, in the export coal industries. And that's gonna require policies which actually actively manage the phase down of that industry in places like the Hunter Valley and in Queensland. And that requires hard conversations with communities and it requires a bit of political courage. But if we don't actually set that as the destination, we'll design a just transition strategy that is just supporting domestic energy workers and not all sort of carbon-based workers across the Australian economy. So I think that's the real challenge and that's the conversation we're having very actively with the minister and others in the government. Thanks, Mark. Indeed, I think it, it is quite challenging. It, it will involve lots of stakeholders and, and some real policy supports need to come out to help people on their day to day and to facilitate the transition with the trainings, with the information sharing, with a lot of effort to make it happen. Um, I, before we further continue this, I also want to just divert a little bit on the beginning of your presentation when you shared about like the journey of the climate change. I, I just want to quickly comment about that. The past 20 years has been really fundamentally changed for the whole climate change issue. I, I joined the first COP um, in 2003, that's COP9, and now we're talking about COP27, and that this past 20 years has been really like the time that we see this whole topic of climate change being fundamentally changed in the global kind of agenda, that now it's real. Everybody treat it with seriousness, and that's why energy transition is happening. But yet, I think when we look at, I think your point really struck me was that if we look at 1.5 degrees, if we look at all those scenarios, it requires us, it requires the energy transition to have high, hair, high share of renewable energies and we, our target need to be here. But if you look at the reality, what is actually happening, uh, every market, which is already going very ambitious on renewables, their target are not here, but here. Mm. And we are here today talking in the past few days about the supply chain challenges, about the permitting challenges, which are the challenges for us to deliver where we are here today to hear that government target as of 2030 or as of 2040, which 
we are already like struggling in delivering from here to here to the kind of BAUs. Yet what the climate imperative is requiring us is to be there. So look at that gap. That gap thing is what I think your previous few slides really strike me. And this is the moment that we, we need to bring it up because the past few days is all about delivering from here to here. Nobody's talking about that gap. Mm. And that's, that's another big challenge. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I'd say a couple of things on that. Um, and as someone who's been swimming around in climate policy and campaigns for the last couple of decades and wishes I'd made a lot more progress than I actually have. Um, uh, but there's this, we're in this moment of great contradiction because we now know that the energy transition is going to happen. Like 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't no. necessarily clear that we were going to be 100% powered by renewable energy. We now know that's going to happen. We now know that our cars are all going to be electric. We know that, you know, so-called hard to abate sectors, it's not actually that hard. It just requires industry policy. It's going to require investment. It's going to require getting industries to scale, etc. Um, so on one level, we're in a great place. But on the ultimate key performance indicator, global emissions are still going up. And warming will still go up until we actually get to net zero globally. Um, and, it, and it's going to be accelerating because our emissions are going up. As we start reducing emissions, warming will start decelerating. Um, so that's a really fundamental contradiction that we all live with, and it's of a hard place, but um, we also know that the cheapest forms of energy are now clean energy. So it's, it's kind of inevitable. So the question is how we do it, and how we do it well, and how we do it really quickly. And you're right, the ambition, um, you know, we're trying to do this, maybe it needs to be here, or maybe it needs to be somewhere up there. Um, and I think when we are thinking about policy and we're thinking about deploying new industries, so a wise colleague um, said to me that we often overestimate what can be achieved in two or three years, and we underestimate what can be achieved in a decade. So I think we need to take that decade view and actually set super ambitious objectives. And in Australia, we're moving from a phase, which I think Europe is already in, where we're moving from problems of ambition, you know, do, uh, do we have an ambitious enough target, do we have politicians who are actually committed to it, et cetera, to problems of implementation. And it requires different skill sets. Once you're trying to achieve really ambitious targets, it requires engineers and logist logisticians and a whole lot of different types of skill sets. So um, I think the task for us is to think very big about what we can achieve in a 10 year time frame, and then build the road um, while we're walking it to that destination. I like that spirit on the positive side that it can suddenly drive more changes. And I do believe that will happen. That gap that we see today between this, the BAUs, and the aspiration of what we need to be, there, there will be a way. That gap can be closed a little further, yeah, in the next, ten, that in the next decade. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, let's come back to the offshore, to Australia. You talked a little bit about like um, the European of supply chain, the vessels, all these issues. And actually for our summit, the theme of this year is on collaboration. And collaboration is so important. And collaboration also has so different aspects. It can be domestic collaboration between regions in Australia. It can be international uh, cross-border collaborations in the APAC region between the region, APAC and US and Europe. It can also be industry itself collaborating between each other. And what's your view on this, on, in terms of the vessels, in terms of the supply chain, in terms of all this? Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, my, the lesson that I really took home from having all of those conversations around global supply chain and shipping industry and the sh shortages of seafarers globally is that if in Australia we think we're going to get an offshore wind construction vessel and crew um, in the southern hemisphere for 12 or 18 months to build one wind farm, um, we're probably kidding ourselves. Like if we want 
companies to make that commitment of, you know, ships that are fully booked for the next four years to this geography, or if we want companies to make the commitment to build new ships to send here, we're going to need a pipeline of projects. And we're going to need a pipeline of training for new seafarers. And that's, you know, one reason why the Maritime Union of Australia has been really at the front of trying to develop this new industry and making sure there's good industry policy um, to get it up and running. But we could be thinking a lot about, well, what does that look like in a regional context? Like, do we need half a dozen construction vessels for the region? Like, can we have 15 or 20 servicing vessels for the region so that we're not just thinking about how do we build an offshore wind industry in Gippsland or Victoria or Australia, but we're actually thinking of ourselves as a geography because, you know, um, parts of Asia have some offshore wind, but it's still an emerging market. Um, Australia is very much a, a, an emerging market and we're competing with much more mature and established markets. So we need to connect up our projects and connect up our supply chains and connect up our shipping vessels and skills, et cetera, so that we can have what we need in our region. Because, you know, to sail a ship from the North Sea to Australia takes quite a long time and costs a lot of money. Whereas to sail a ship from, you know, Newcastle to Singapore is, is a much shorter journey. So we, we could really be thinking about how we establish a regional pipeline of projects and skills. Yeah, exactly. That's what we discussed yesterday, regional collaboration and how do we break that whole mentality that a lot of the APEC countries has that nationalism thing that I want to do it all. It cannot... It, in this industry, with this global race, every region, Europe, US, everybody is accelerating their energy transition. There's no way that you come along and with a mentality that I will develop my whole set of supply chain and I have the most strict kind of requirement on local content or this and that, you will drive the industry away. And we need a more collaborative mindset that's the only way forward. That's the only way that this energy transition can happen. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the industry policy. Um, I think the Spain case showed us that it's instrumental if we want to see the real transition on energy. And if we want to see further the just transition to happen, you need the policies. And in some of the APEC countries, they are quite advanced in a very comprehensive industrial policy. What, what do you comment on the Australian side? Yeah, well, Australia hasn't, over the past three or four decades, been particularly good at industry policy. And the tide has really went out on it. Um, and, you know, neoliberal economics, which largely saw government um, uh, leave it to markets to decide where to invest, has been the dominant um, mode for much of the past two or three decades. But I think we're seeing, particularly with COVID, uh, we're seeing governments globally deciding to play a much more active role in um, establishing new industries, in uh, um, working through supply chain and, and labour issues. And I think we have a new appetite for industry development in Australia. But I think our muscles are uh, are pretty underdeveloped. We need to, you know, build our muscles in industry development um, and that, and build our capability. And that requires governments to be clear about the destination that we're trying to get to. It also requires being prepared to accept that there'll probably be some failures along the way. Um, uh, but, you know, a government that tells a story of we need these industries of the future, so we're going to bring forward the date that commercial decisions would be made in these geographies is a really powerful signal. Um, and ah, I had another thought, but it's just disappeared. I'll stop talking. <laughs> no worries. It's, it's, it's really good. I think you, you touch on that point that once you set the course, once you set the direction to be we are on this track, energy transition, no doubt about it, yeah. no coming back, then that already clears a lot of the doubts out. 
that will give us the industry's kind of commitment for investment yeah. for lots of things. Yeah, yeah. and I think what I, what I was going to say was I think we've seen the blueprint for that in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, in the EU with their Green New Deal, in South Korea with their COVID response as well, massive investment in, uh, in clean energy, in China's very actively um, shaping their renewable energy industry. And um, so I, I think we're, we're entering a new mode, an era when government, active government participation and curation of new industries is seen as not just des um, desirable, but necessary if you want a piece of the action. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's also remarkable that Yes, we got this time that we are coming out of COVID, but we are also happy to say, to see that all the COVID recovery plan is having an energy transition kind of like elements in it, or energy transition being the backbone of a lot of those, those, those deals or agreements, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And because governments invested so much in those COVID recovery packages and are now gonna be facing you know, budgetary pressures for years to come, mm. we actually need to make sure that the big investments that government is making are solving multiple problems. They can't just be reducing emissions. Like in Australia, we have a, and many parts of the world, huge housing crisis happening as well. So we need to be thinking about how we're dealing with these, you know, crises of inequality, climate change, housing together and, and, and forming policy which is actually ticking several boxes rather than just one. Yeah. I think it also comes to the time that the, the renewable energy technology also proved itself that we are capable. The technology is mature enough that technically and economically it's viable. That's the key. That's why all these other things are possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and if I could say, there's, there's probably a bunch of industry folks in the room um, I've worked pretty closely with the Australian renewable energy industry, or parts of it, over the last couple of decades. And um, I think we, we need to move from a mindset of, you know, 10% year-on-year growth is a good result. Like, there's no doubt from a business perspective that's true. From a solving climate change perspective, like, we need to be really, really ambitious. Like, we need 60, 70, 80% year-on-year growth. Um, so I just really encourage you when you're having those conversations and setting those strategies and company targets, like, um, there's a real opportunity to align commercial objectives with solving the biggest problem of our time. Great, thanks. I think we're almost at the end. Um, just. How do you want to wrap up? <laughs> and any, uh, yeah, any words to the audience today? Uh, look, thanks for coming. Uh, it's still a very big room, isn't it? <laughs> I'm really glad you stayed here till the end and uh, feel free to come and have a chat afterwards. Um, it's, a it's a really exciting moment for Australia with the development of these new industries, really exciting moment for the region. Um, and let's just make the absolute most of it. Thanks very much, Mark. Thank you. Let's make it happen.